Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Karen Goroleski, and I am the CEO of ASTMH, the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. It's a special honor for me today to welcome you today to this, our next fireside chat. Today, we will hear from Dr. Julie Jacobson and Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, WHO's chief scientist. They're gonna talk a bit about how courage, compassion, and culture are influencing and can influence people's lives and their work. These three words, courage, compassion, and culture, are the framework for Julie's vision for ASTMH this year, and also the theme of our annual meeting that will be held in November. Julie, of course, is president of ASTMH, and Dr. Sumia, as I said, is chief scientist at WHO. She has a robust career of challenges, probably this time right now is her most challenging time in her career, but she has a career of challenges, achievements, awards, recognitions, and a wide range of domestic and international posts. We were very fortunate to have uh, her deliver the Marco Longo lecture at our virtual annual meeting last year, and I hope that we can get you there in person very soon. I'm on the Fogarty International Center's advisory board, and I'm delighted to say that Dr. Sumia is a former Fogarty grantee. I won't take too much time on this, but I do want to share a quote from her that I read that said, Fogarty brings people together of different backgrounds and gets them to speak one language, the language of science. We all certainly agree with that. Dr. Sumia, thank you for your willingness to share your time today, especially given the demands on you and WHO due to the pandemic. We're very grateful for your time and of course, of your efforts. For our viewers, we aren't able to take questions at this time, but this session will be posted later to ASTMH's YouTube channel, where you can also view Julie's previous fireside chat with Dr. Bill Fagey. Now, over to you, Julie. Thanks, Karen. Really appreciate that. And so I again want to reiterate how grateful I am for you making time today to talk with us about this um, theme around compassion, culture, and courage. Um, because when I think of those words, I think of you and the many times that we've met throughout our careers. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, so I have a couple of questions to get us started. Um, the first one is, you know, this has been an incredibly trying time for us uh, all over the world, um, but you have actually literally been in the epicenter of this when we talk about uh, uh, the COVID experience, the pandemic, all of the challenges that are facing us at WHO. And so can you say a little bit about how uh, compassion, culture, courage, have they been part of the response? How is that? How have those pieces come through in, in the response to the pandemic and particularly right now with the incredible challenge that's going on in India that's breaking my heart? Thank you very much, uh, Julie. And also thanks to Karen for that nice introduction. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be speaking with you today on this very uh, interesting and relevant theme of compassion culture and, and courage. And I think it encapsulates a lot of what I've experienced over the last year uh, and, and a few months. And many, I'm sure, around the world have experienced this. In fact, as we speak, uh, you know, and we see the situation in India and many other countries around the world where people are really struggling, not only to get access to medical care, but just struggling, you know, to live their daily lives. Um, children who haven't been able to go to school, people who've lost their uh, jobs and their livelihoods and, you know, really don't know what the future is going to bring. Um, young people who were looking forward, you know, with a lot of excitement and anticipation to perhaps starting on their careers, either you know, joining college or leaving college and getting into, and then healthcare workers, of course, who've had to really face the brunt of uh, the onslaught of this uh, pandemic and have been stretched in, in most uh, countries that we know of. So what comes to my mind is really courage, you know, that, that was shown. Uh, the first thing when I think of is healthcare workers and the courage that they showed, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, when we knew very little 
about this virus. It was very frightening and very scary. And there were patients coming in who were sick and who, were, who needed help. There was not enough PPE to go around. And yet, healthcare workers around the world did their job, did their duties, took care of people. Many got the infection, many died. And um, you know they took it as part of their professional responsibility and duty. And that really inspired me and inspired uh, a lot of us. It's not easy when you're faced with that kind of situation to put duty above your own personal safety. And I think that's real courage uh, to me. There have been other kinds of courage also exhibited by um, scientists, by public health officials, you know, who've had to stand up for the truth sometimes in the face of denialism, in the face of conspiracy theories, you know, in the face of backlash. Uh, but people have stood up, stood their ground and uh, stood for their beliefs and had the courage of their conviction to really speak truth to power. Uh, and, and, and a lot of people like that, that uh, we can see around and admire. And the WHO has also had uh, its fair share, I think, of, uh, uh, of challenges, uh, which uh, is not entirely unexpected because when you're faced with a pandemic, uh, it is difficult to pivot and to respond quickly uh, and, and do the right thing at the right time and you know, do it fast enough. And so there are always um, situations where in retrospect, in hindsight, you feel you could have done it differently or done it better or done it faster. But I think overall, looking at the way that the WHO responded, I think that at least my colleagues and I, who've been working you know, from January 1st of 2020, really as a team, really coming together, you know, we have a, a large emergencies program, but then we have all of the other disease and technical programs and science division which really brought the focus on evidence, on the review of literature, on the focus on research and evidence generation and bringing academics and scientists together from all over the world to share and collaborate. And that's been such a wonderful experience, really, the spirit with which uh, people were willing to work together, willing to share knowledge uh, without any kind of restrictions or boundaries. You know, it's, it's been quite an unprecedented uh, experience for me and we've learned so much as a result of, uh, of that. And I think WHO's role in facilitating and coordinating and guiding research right from the beginning of this pandemic, I, I believe has also played a critical role. Um, so a lot of us have had to face uh, difficult situations and have had to have the courage to, to face them, but also I think compassion, without compassion, I think we could not have got this far and, and we still need to feel that compassion uh, for each other, for those who are, are having a tough time. And there are many people who are going through very difficult uh, situation. And then of course the culture, I think culture within the organization, the culture of within a society, the resilience that communities and societies have shown, the families have shown, I think is also something that's really stood out. And I think many people have said that the pandemic has helped them uh, to really get to know what the priorities are in life and, and how to refocus you know, yourself on what the important things are. and How can you really make the world a better place in the future? So a lot of reflection I think uh, has, has happened. And um, it obviously it all hasn't been at all pleasant uh, for people. There's been a, so much of pain and hardship that everyone has experienced, but the, the only reason we've got by, I think, is because of the basic humanity that came out. I think more good, definitely, than bad in this world, more people who want to do good and who want to stand by each other. So we would have learned a lot of lessons, I think, by the time this is over. And I hope that we can use those lessons to build a better and a fairer world. Yeah. Yeah, that interconnectedness piece that we, we now realize that we are definitely not living in a bubble or we are living in a bubble that just happens to be the planet Earth, <laughs> right? Doesn't have to do with the passport, doesn't have to do with those other pieces. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that leads me to another question because you've had a, a very illustrious career and have worked in different organizations, different countries, different cultures, 
And I'm just curious about how, how moving between those environments you had to adapt and how if you've come up with any challenges that moving between different worlds like that um, and, and what you've had to do to overcome those challenges. Well, I think perhaps I was uh, lucky because as a child, I got exposed to many different cultures. As you know, India is a, is a vast country. Uh, it's, a, it's a subcontinent and it's like being in a place where there are many countries, uh, just that you can move freely across different languages, different uh, food habits, of course, lots of differences between urban and rural environment. And I had a chance, I think, growing up to travel a fair amount and meet different kinds of people and, and see the different kinds of environments and get to hear a, diff, a lot of different views. And, and also I met a lot of people. My father was a, uh, a scientist and there were a lot of scientists from around the world who would come and visit uh, us in our home. So I think that made a difference in terms of being exposed really right from a very young age to different cultures. And I remember we grew up in a very progressive household in Delhi, in a very urban environment. But every summer holiday, we would go to a small town in Tamil Nadu in the south of India, where practices and the culture was very different, was much more conservative. And we had to adapt and we had to behave differently and we had to dress differently um, than we could in Delhi. And so we learned very early well, early on that, you know, the adaptability element, uh, I think, and we might have complained at times, but I think we, it was a very good uh, experience. So we also, you know, in Delhi, uh, where I grew up, of course, you have a very uh, mixed uh, group of people uh, coming from different backgrounds and cultures. My friends were from all over. So you, you listen, hear different languages, you, you know, you're with, with different families. So perhaps that's what prepared me later to a professional career. I moved around the world and lived in different uh, countries. Uh, it was never a, a culture shock. It was never difficult. Of course, there are every country and every place has its own, um, you know, chain. You have to adapt to certain ways of doing things. Uh, the language, even if it's English, it's spoken slightly differently. There are do's and don'ts. And, in culture that you pick up quite quickly. Um, but in my professional uh, career, I, I think it's usually been a very positive experience for me to be in a different place. And it's, uh, I've never experienced uh, any kind of, uh, never felt that I had uh, a disadvantage really because I was uh, coming from a different uh, environment. And of course the WHO is uh, almost like a mini world. Uh, <laughs> one of the first things that, uh, fun things that uh, I do sometimes is when I sit in a meeting, you close your eyes. Of course, now we're all on Zoom, but even when you're physically present in a room is to try to guess where an uh, individual may be from, which country, or at least try to pinpoint a region, if not the exact country. And uh, because you hear so many different accents, even though people may be speaking in English, um, that in a room, you will probably have, you know, uh, staff from every region in the world. So it's a real melting pot. And that's what adds, I think, to the strength of WHO is the diversity uh, of not only backgrounds, but experiences uh, that people bring. And, um, and so I really enjoy that. I really enjoy working in, with a group of people who bring such different perspectives to uh, the work that we do. Yeah, I, the melting pot of India is quite an amazing, amazing place to be because any pocket that you go to is, a, is such a unique experience. And the number of languages, I mean, I think a lot of people in around the world don't realize that and how that gives rise to so many different interesting cultural differences that happen there. So exactly. a really interesting piece. And I love the language part because, you know, one of my favorite, I worked with a, a person who was... Um, Chinese from China uh, when I was working on Japanese encephalitis and he was taught English by somebody from uh, from uh, England and so he had this English accent that just totally confused me every time he, he talked so <laughs> those mixes and minglings between different cultures too that add to the diversity of our work and uh, yeah as we become this single planet. <clears throat> 
So um, I was going to ask you how your culture has shaped your work and your career. You've given a little bit of the answer to that in your last question, but do you have any other thoughts that you'd like to share about how your culture specifically has affected your work? Well, I think it's been, again, um, my exposure to uh, maybe because of the disease that I worked in, tuberculosis, for most of my professional life, but also diseases like uh, HIV, you know, other infectious diseases. I mean, when you live in India, you are uh, seeing, you know, dengue that comes year after year. I spent many years in Chennai. We still had leptospirosis outbreaks, filariasis, of course, when we were growing up you know, to seeing people with elephantiasis was extremely common. And we would uh, really wonder as children, you know, what, what this disease was. Mm -hmm. Of course, luckily now it's much, uh, it's, it's much, much better. It's being uh, controlled to a large extent and you don't see elephantiasis uh, any, uh, that much anymore, even though you know that uh, filariasis is still a long way away from being eliminated. Um, and also the fact that I got I went into the communities where these patients uh, came from. So tuberculosis, the way we worked was it was a research institute and we were running these clinical trials and we had cohorts and so on. And if people didn't show up on the uh, appointed day, we would actually try and find out why. And you know, sometimes the community health workers would go out, but um, very often the, the doctor, if I was uh, on call that day, I would actually be the one who would go off. So we would get into a Jeep, uh, a group of us, it would be a doctor, sometimes a nurse or a community health worker, the driver. We would go on a round of these uh, slums in Chennai, uh, where unfortunately most of the TB patients came from the lower income uh, areas of the city. And I really got to know quite well those, those areas. And when I went in there and saw the kind of uh, environment that they lived in and all of the other life challenges that they had, then I realized that coming and taking their treatment for TB that particular day was not the top priority on their list really. I mean, they had to put food on the table for their family. Uh, um, that, that was more important. Um, and then, you know, the, the other things like alcoholism and, and all the violence that happens uh, in these environments that, you know, with poverty, basically the social determinants of health that we often don't think about when you're sitting in a clinic and treating a person with a disease, you're thinking about the disease and how you can cure it. You don't think that much about why did it happen? What were the determinants? And, and the determinants not only that increase risk for the disease, but also increase the risk of bad outcomes. And we know now that, you know, for if you take non-communicable diseases and uh, cardiovascular disease, for example, the outcomes clearly depend on the socioeconomic group that you come from, regardless of, you know, what drugs you might uh, have access to. So, so those kind of um, insights you get only when you go into the community and you try to explore the broader ecosystem. Similarly, I've been in tribal areas, in remote tribal areas in India, which are some of the most beautiful places. And you think this is idyllic, you know, wouldn't you like to live in a place like this, which has still got forest, it's green, it's got fresh air. But then you look at access to healthcare, you look at again, the struggle for the essentials of daily life. And then I would go and talk to these villagers about uh, TB and they, and they would say, well, yeah, once in a while we hear about someone getting TB, but that's really not our top health priority. You know, if you really want to know what we think, then for us, you know, clean drinking water, you know, access to a good facility where if somebody falls down and has a fracture, then, you know, we have to travel hundreds of Miles to get that person looked at. I mean, those are the kind of things that uh, are much more critical for us. So again, you start seeing from a different perspective. So, and this is how I then understood that the social and behavioral sciences are so important, especially when you're dealing with large public health problems. A purely biomedical approach is probably probably not going to uh, solve it for you. And you know, we've seen this in filariasis as well, right? Why people don't want to take the preventive medicine when they are feeling absolutely well and they don't see any reason why they should take a medicine to prevent a disease which you know they don't think is very serious or they haven't seen people affected with it and they might have some small side effects from a disease so these large prevention programs unless you involve the community and engage them and empower them and it's run in fact led by them 
only then are they successful. And we've seen that in COVID as well in countries or in regions which have had strong primary health care systems with community engagement where the community health workers are really trusted members of the community and were able to put in place systems very early on. Those are the countries that have done well and that have been more resilient uh, because they've invested in, in public health and primary health care. And many of these are low middle income countries or even low income countries. Not, so they're not using high technology, but they've invested in people and they've invested in those relationships. So I think those are the kind of insights that help me now when I think about when we're developing a guideline here, how do we make that guideline really effective? What are the uh, viewpoints we need to consider? Who are the stakeholders that we need to consult? And then in what format, uh, who's the audience really for the guideline and how do we make sure that it gets implemented? Where, how do we make that link with the policymaker? So it's a complex process, of course, health policy making. And um, so in the science division and WHO, we're really trying to focus on making our normative work much more impactful. I think your, your reflections on your own personal experience of leaving from where you work and going into the communities, the, the fact that human, the human experience in all of our countries and all of our settings is so diverse and that we have people of means and people with, uh, without means that are in all of our countries. And I, I, I think and I reflect on that in my global health work, it's really, and as a primary care trained physician, you know, taking care of the whole system is part of the ethos of how my brain works. Um, but then realizing when I traveled and then coming back, my own kind of hypocrisy around challenge, the challenges of my own country and how to do that and like breaking down those barriers and how important those lessons are, you know, for really uh, diversifying your experience to be able to be better at the work and the things that you offer. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm wondering about um, the, the underlying piece of inequity that you brought up and, and how we know that inequity drives um, a lot of the health disparities that we see now. And so how, how do you think we can work more to overcome and address those underlying inequities? If you have this I answer, the first thing is the Nobel Prize, you know? <laughs> exactly. But you know, the first thing is to shine a spotlight on it. And that means data, you know? Mm -hmm. And we are often talking about data because I think we really struggle to get um, data that's disaggregated by age, by sex, by geography, by income status, by rural, urban, et cetera, and by other factors that might be impacting people's uh, social status. Um, and when you, when you do see data disaggregated like that, then it starts becoming, you know, it starts jumping out at you actually, the fact that any health indicator you take, you know, you can see that gradient across the socioeconomic uh, in every country in the world. So the first, so for the policymaker, I think it's important to, to see that because if you don't see it, then it's not very clear. So the, really we need to put a focus on collecting data and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and being able to see that data uh, or displaying it in a way which makes analyzing and displaying in a way that, uh, that brings out the inequities. Then of course, one has to uh, understand the factors behind that. And we know it's multi, multifactorial. So poverty is associated with so many of the other risk factors that increase your risk of poor health, both communicable and non-communicable. You know, it was believed for a long time that it was infectious diseases that the poor people would be more susceptible to. And it is true, you have more malaria, you have more TB, you have more diarrheal infections and so on. But it's clear now that non-communicable disease as well, yeah, there's a much higher risk, uh, you know, with poverty, the association with poverty and hypertension, poverty and uh, depression and other forms of mental illness um, are very clear and even poverty and diabetes. So there have been surveys in India which show that the highest rates of increase in diabetes are among the urban poor. Mm. Um, again, because of a number of risk factors. So um, it, it impacts in so many different ways and it impacts not only your risk of getting the disease, but also the risk of then being able to access high quality uh, health services and, and 
be able to then take care of your disease again because there are competing priorities. So there has to be a very, uh, I think, uh, thoughtful and a focused approach, a deliberate approach, I think, to dealing with that inequity, which has to be built into health policy. Um, otherwise, uh, it will not happen automatically. So one really needs to think about the barriers that people face and, and try and address those barriers. And I think there is a lot more now awareness and discussion of this issue. And I'm particularly in the midst of rolling out the COVID vaccines. And every day when I see the figures, uh, you know, I really feel depressed that one in four people now in high income countries have had their vaccine and it's still less than one in 100 in many, many countries where people, yeah. even the healthcare workers have still not been protected. You know, and there's still healthcare workers dying from COVID when yeah. they really shouldn't be. So there's the global, uh, you know, situation of inequity. And then of course there is within every country and within every sub-region, you would find the same. So this really needs to be, I think, uh, addressed, uh, there needs to be some kind of, uh, at the global level, you know, there is a lot of talk about solidarity and collaboration and so on. But at least for the future, I think when we're thinking about some of the big threats to humanity, the problem cannot be solved country by country. So it's things like a pandemic where you need everyone to come together and, and have some rules uh, and a playbook that everybody follows. Uh, similarly, for climate change, I would imagine that it's the same uh, for antimicrobial resistance as well. These are some of the, the big global challenges, and there are many more that we need to address, you know, as a global community. But then again, um, so then that takes care of some of the big global inequities, but at the same time, within a country, this needs to actually be applied so that it's... Uh, addressing the needs of, of the poorest and the most vulnerable. And I think with uh, the increasing use of digital tools and technologies, I always uh, worry that this would be one more element that creates a digital divide. It, it, there is a potential for digital technology for many countries and populations to leapfrog uh, into a next generation of, of healthcare, which can actually be very good. Uh, yeah. What we've seen from what's happening with education around the world today, that clearly there are many people who do not have access to online education and are going to suffer much more than um, those children uh, in, in parts of the world that do have access to online. And even though that hasn't been ideal, they haven't uh, missed as much as those who have had absolutely no access. So because we're pushing digital health and digital technology in a big way, we need to think right from the beginning about building that infrastructure so that you know the ones that are always left out or left behind are not yeah yeah and so i, I hear two things in your in your answer because there's the data component but then there's also the experience component that you bring out because you have to be aware that each data point is a human being <laughs> and they yeah. have multiple influences in their life and if we can't bring those two pieces together we we, we won't deal with inequity or at mm -hmm. least effectively yeah. Um, so I remember meeting you at ICMR when you were the director of ICMR, huge institute, Indian Council of Medical Research, and uh, responsible for so much that happens throughout the, the, the country and diversity of topics. I remember walking into your office for a meeting and you were standing at a table, standing probably because you would have been overcome by the stacks of paperwork that were in front of you. And there literally was a full long table filled with stacks that were as tall as you when you were standing. And you were like, oh, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, what is that? You know, are you cleaning out a closet? And this, these were the things that you had to deal with. You know, and you're like, well, I have to get through these today, you know, because for my work. And I was just completely overwhelmed just thinking about getting through, you know, three, you know, three files on that, let alone the full stacks. And Yet, you ca we came in to talk about lymphatic filariasis and the new triple drug therapy, ivermectin, DEC, and albendazole mm -hmm. for that, that we were working on, and you made time, you were present, and you were pleasant. And I'm just wondering, how do you, 
how do you find that way of creating that balance between an overwhelming ta overwhelming amount of work and tasks that you have and and still being able to have a conversation like this today even you know uh, when you have so much on your plate yeah i think you have to find time for the important things in life because otherwise you can get overwhelmed yeah i had to take care of a lot of paperwork when i was in that position and i I probably some of that was unnecessary, but that's the way the system was working. But it was the kind of conversations that we had where there was a problem to be solved. Lymphatic filariasis, clearly the new results had just come out, you know, showing that triple drug is better than the, uh, the standard therapy that we were using. How do we implement that now? And how do we get that accepted? And how do we get that scaled? That was a wonderful challenge, you know, to think about. And I was in a position where we needed to take the research evidence to the policy and then do some implementation research perhaps to show that it was feasible and, and scalable before it, it would become policy. So I guess that's what, uh, I had those interludes during the day, the rest of the time I was doing probably boring paperwork, but there were those interesting interludes where I would discuss with either our staff or some you know people who came in from other organizations on some challenges or problems that needed to be solved. And I think for a scientist, basically you need a problem to be working on. And that's what keeps you motivated and keeps you running. And that's when I'm at, you know, most happy as well, when there's a problem and you're trying to find a solution and addressing it. And if you're able to do that, working with like-minded people collaboratively. Um, and again, I really believe that you need to discuss with many stakeholders, many viewpoints, and bring in um, interdisciplinarity into your discussions. And I remember when I was at the head of the ICMR that I really believed we needed civil society voice, the non-governmental organizations as well, because they have a very unique perspective. They have their ears very close to the ground and they can really ground you in what you were doing. Uh, and I tried to bring that. And also I increased a lot of our communication with, uh, with journalists and with the media, because I felt again, as scientists, we needed to communicate on things, good and bad, you know, put the data out there, inform people, improve health literacy. These are things that still need to be done. A big challenge as we're seeing now, right? With the conspiracy theories and misinformation, what we call the infodemic side by side with the pandemic is really confusing people and preventing them from adopting healthy behaviors. And so I think that's a big job that we have a responsibility, which uh, we have to find time for. And uh, so I think it's, it's very nice to be able to share some um, of my thoughts and, you know, through my own lived experiences, uh, perhaps to where I am today and, uh, and what I'm doing. And every day I, I go to work really, uh, you know, with a positive frame of mind, even though there's so much desolation and, you know, you could get very depressed if you looked at what was happening around, but, as long as you're trying to work towards a solution um, and something that can hopefully last into the future and make things better. I do hope that even the models of R&D that we use today, you know, we need to redefine what a global public good is, what, is a, yeah. what needs to be developed by the world and for the world um, and, and bring the private sector together with the public sector to work like that. So that's my, my hope and dream and I think, uh, we, we should get there one day. That sounds like a perfect way to end our fireside chat. <laughs> I want to thank you for the inspiring words and your time today and wish you well on the challenges that are ahead and know that we at ASTMH and uh, globally are behind you and the success in helping us overcome the challenge of this. And we appreciate having your leadership uh, as part of this response. So thank you for being here with us. Thank you so much, really. Thank you, Nancy, a match. <laughs>